Hey everyone, Rarity Dash here, time for another blind commentary. And today I'm finally looking at the World of Rima videos for Ruby Volume 4. Or, well, the last four uh, World of Remnant videos. I already looked at the four for the different kingdoms, but uh, got a different four for today. And uh, these, some of these have been out for a while. Most of these have been out for at least a few weeks. Uh, they sort of came out between episodes and stuff, but I didn't get to them until now because they were never uploaded on the Rooster Teeth YouTube channel. Uh, and... Theoretically, we're supposed to wait until stuff is uploaded there before we react to it. But they were uploaded on the Rooster Teeth uh, website and on their Crunchyroll uh, page. So, uh, I guess it's safe. Other people have reacted to it. I don't know. And uh, I just figured I wanted to watch these at least before I watched the finale of Volume 4. Just in case there's something important in these and... I, I just figure like they might have a bigger impact if I watch them now before I see that than wait until after sometime. So, yeah. Just gonna go ahead and do it. Uh, the four we have are Between Kingdoms, Faunus, Schnee Dust Company, and The Great War. So, yeah, this could be a, uh, a pretty interesting set of videos. Some stuff there that I don't really know too much about. The Great War in particular. That's something that really hasn't been discussed too in-depthly. I mean, there was that speech by Ozpin, and it's been referenced here and there, but we still, we still don't know exactly what it's all about uh, in the most plain terms. Uh, there's also stuff, the Faunus, that could be interesting, and uh, the Schnee Dust Company, I'd like to hear more about the backstory of that. So uh, hopefully they prove informative. Let's get started and find out. Okay. And here we go. Ruby World of Remnant. Between Kingdoms. So, now you know more about Crow. the kingdoms. But what's between the big cities? Lots of grim and villages. All right. The easy answer is Rim. <laughs> yeah. No reason to beat around the bush. They're out there, and it probably won't go well if you run into one. That's okay, because you're a huntsman. Or huntress. Yeah. And you've trained at one of the major academies, so you're probably fine. Just don't get yourself overrun by a pack of them. Yeah, that would be bad. Now, after a long day of killing Grimm and saving the world, you're going to probably want to stop at a small town inn. Mm -hmm. Small villages dot the land between the major cities. You might ask, with the wilderness being so dangerous, why not just live in the big cities? Well, that life isn't meant for everyone. These small towns are founded by people that have a problem with the kingdoms, or don't want to deal with the kingdom's problems, or maybe just enjoy the simpler life and would rather take their chances in the wild than in a Fair kingdom. enough. It goes well, about as well as you'd think. Yeah. If the founders are smart, then there's a good chance these towns can survive for the same reason the kingdoms continue to. Mm -hmm. Natural barriers, strong Makes defenses, sense. and stubborn citizens. If you don't have at least a few of those, then you know, the chances of a town lasting more than a year isn't great. Unfortunately, it's not just the Grim running around ruining towns. Wandering bandits. Bandits are another yeah. threat. These Raven. groups of usually fairly skilled fighters travel the lands, never settling in one place. They often prey on convoys, sending goods between kingdoms. That's not all. Love the visuals These for this one. Will often wait for a town to be at its weakest. Lots of fun maybe animations. After a grim attack, or while its fighters are out hunting, before finally moving in at night and striking. Bunch of jerks. <laughs> the worst part is, if the grim hadn't attacked before. You better be damn sure they will now. Yeah. And you can't exactly have bandits raid your town without at least a few negative emotions. Uh-huh. This is also why bandits never stay in the towns they conquer. With attitudes like the ones they have, Grimm tend to be pretty interested in them as well. As long as they keep I can moving, imagine. they've got a better chance of survival. Besides these small towns, the areas between kingdoms really depend on the continent. Harsh deserts, icy tundras, 
lush forests, you name it. At this point, pretty much every inch of remnant has been mapped out. Mm -hmm. Although there are some areas that no one's gone into and come out alive. Oh. And of course, I am intrigued. Somewhere out there is where she is. Oh. Really raising that question. I'm sure we'll find it out eventually. Faunus. You know, most of us spend a lot of time talking about mankind versus Grimm, but technically there is a third party in the mix. Yeah. The Faunus. In case you're not in the know, the Faunus are a species on Remnant that appear to be human in just about every way. Every way but one. Each faunus has a single animalistic trait. Mm -hmm. Some more apparent than others. Ram horns, tiger claws, cat ears. <laughs> Blake. I swear, on my huntsman's license, I once saw a guy regrow his severed lizard tail. Oh. I swear, no amount of drinking can make you forget that <laughs> pretty picture. As far as everyone's aware, faunus have been around as long as mankind, if not a little longer. History gets a little fuzzy past a certain point, but we do know that their kind and ours are completely compatible from a uh, biological standpoint. Cool. Take two wolf faunas, and you get a little wolf cub kiddo. A wolf faunus and a human also typically means your little bundle of joy's teething phase could get a little dicey. But if you take a wolf faunus and a bull faunus, for example, it's a complete roll of the dice. Oh, For all you know, interesting. You be cleaning up your son's shedded snake skin. <sighs> Scientists are still scratching their heads when it comes to, well, a lot about the faunus. But science isn't the real problem. It's how we all get along. Or, in this case, how we don't. Yeah. Early man was scared to death of the faunus. And honestly, it's not too hard to sympathize with that. Seeing something that looks like you and acts like you walk out of the forest and reveal a pair of fangs can be a little upsetting. Yeah? Like most things man doesn't understand, all sorts of rumors and stories surround the faunus. People avoided them like the plague, pushing them out of settlements and sometimes even hunting them down. Oh. Man began to outnumber the faunus. And the faunus began to consider man nothing more than a hostile species. <laughs> Can't really blame them. These clashes uh -huh. between species were unavoidable, as the was safe from the Grim was in constant short supply. But it was the Grim that finally brought humans and faunas together for the first time. A village in Sanus fell under attack, and the only reason anyone survived was because the humans and faunas united against their common enemy. It was a step in the right direction, but it didn't fix everything. Once humanity learned they weren't so different from the faunas, they still used those differences as an excuse to exploit and alienate mm -hmm. them. The treatment of the faunas differed around the world, and things wouldn't improve much for them until the Great War. Veil and vacuo against mantle and mystery. Oh. A war unlike anyone had ever seen. And when it was over, the world was desperate to find compromises that would ensure they'd never see the likes of it again. Faunus were awarded equal rights as citizens of Remnant, and as an apology, they were given an entire continent of their own to do with as they pleased. There were some that saw this as fair and just, but many saw it for what it really was, a slap in the face from a nation of sore losers. And so Menagerie was born. There's still faunus all over the world, though the fair treatment they were promised varies in quality from place to place. Yeah, I can imagine. Menagerie will always be their safe haven. Here's the thing, though. You can only push and prod people so much before they reach a tipping point. And when you pack those people together, it just makes it all the easier for them to get organized and get even. White Fang, yeah. <laughs>
Cool. Schnee Dust Company. I supposed to talk about next <laughs> oh crow's great at this oh, oh boy yeah, great narrator okay i've got a few words to say about this one the schnee dust company bunch of self-entitled monopolizing snobs who only care about making a profit no matter how many little people they gotta step on to make it happen <clears throat> but uh, that's just my opinion as you all know, our survival in the world of Remnant depends almost entirely on a crystallized substance known as dust. It powers our cities, fuels our machines, mm -hmm. and gives us a fighting chance against the creatures of Grim. Which means it's extremely valuable. Yeah. Nowadays, it's almost impossible to buy dust products without the Schnee Company snowflakes stamped on the box. But it didn't always used to be that. Nicholas Schnee was the son of a dust miner turned soldier. Born just after the Great War, he found himself at the perfect point in history to take full advantage of the world's next industrial revolution. The Kingdom of Mantle, soon to be Atlas, was in a transformative period. They'd found themselves on the forefront of technology, but realized they depleted nearly all of their natural resources to do so. That's where old Nick Rather than watch his kingdom become dependent on the aid of others, young Nicholas Schnee decided to spend his days at combat school, his nights working alongside his father in the dwindling mantle mines, at any time in between learning everything he could about anything he didn't know. Hmm. That kid had a fire in his belly. When his father died, he left his son everything he had. It wasn't much, but it was enough for Nick to set his plan he left school, rallied all the men he could afford, and set out on an expedition to find a dust deposit that could revitalize his kingdom. And wouldn't you know, he actually pulled it off. Fast forward just a few years, and the name Schnee suddenly meant something. <laughs> Quality, affordability, trust. See? All those years spent in combat school were so that Nick could personally oversee every new expedition. People appreciate a man who's willing to stick his neck out for them. Mm -hmm. That's how the Schnee Dust Company earned the business of every kingdom and remnant. And then things went wrong. Fortunately, it's also what led to an early retirement. Nick had started a family that missed him, and his body was tired. Years of working in dust mines can have some nasty side effects on your health. So enters Jacques. <laughs> Having married into the family, Jacques decided. Yeah, to and this is where that was revealed first. <laughs> he was uh, a lot of words I shouldn't repeat. <laughs> Most importantly, still want to meet Weiss's mom. Jacques She's got to be interesting. Nicholas, that he was the perfect man to run the SDC in his place, and from a certain point of view, he was right. Under Jacques' leadership. The Schnee Dust Company has become more profitable than ever, completely mm -hmm. dominating the industry, but at the cost of the company's soul. Cheap labor, dangerous working conditions, doing whatever it takes to destroy the competition. Jacques Schnee doesn't care about people. He cares nope. about winning. <laughs> that, and making sure he's got the best damn PR team in the world. The Schnee name still means something. But as for what it'll mean tomorrow, well, your guess is as good as mine. Aw, Weiss. Though, now it's looking more like it'll mean Whitley. <laughs> and the final one, which is a long one. The Great War. The Great War. What a terrible name for such a horrible time <laughs> in history. Yeah. 
doubt it was that great. The war itself lasted around 10 years. The century leading up to it was filled with so much tension, you might as well lump them together. Hmm. And most of that tension was coming from Mistral. Oh. Territories rich with resources and safe from Grimm have always been in high demand. But the Emperor of Mistral had managed to conquer nearly all that Anima had to offer. Thanks in part to an unlikely friend, Mantle. Hmm. The two kingdoms had formed an alliance. Mistral provided the small kingdom with goods unavailable in the frozen tundra. In return, Mantle introduced technological innovation as well as guidance in the settlement of Anima's cold northern territory. It was good, until it wasn't. Oh. An incident in Mantle led to a strange and unexpected decree. The abolishment of the arts and repression of self-expression. The people of Mantle had come to believe that they would be much safer from the Grimm if they could simply keep the emotions of the masses in check. Ah, that kind of makes strong sense. Strong artistic culture. Not the good approach. Not Many a good approach, but it makes sense at least. Their alliance. But they were wrong. Mistral complied, selectively, enforcing Mantle's wishes only in the Outer Territories, allowing the centralized powers to continue to live as they please. Oh, well that's gonna cause problems. If you haven't caught on yet, Mistral's full of jerks. <laughs> the people of Vale had a problem with this. Well, they had a problem with a lot of things Mistral and Mantle had been up to. Treatment of their citizens, use of slave labor, and their constant insistence that their way of life was what was best for everyone. Eventually, Mistral made the jump across the sea to the eastern coast of Samus. The small islands and peninsulas in the area were perfect to establish a settlement. They were so perfect, in fact, that Vale had just begun settling the area themselves. I think we can all guess what happened next. The King of Vale did everything he could to avoid armed conflict. Despite cries from his people, he insisted on sharing the land with the settlers from Mistral. But... <sighs> to this day, no one knows who shot first. But what began as a riot between the two bands of settlers... ...had suddenly become the first battle of the Great War. Mantle quickly came to Mistral's side. Battles were fought on both Sanus and Anima soil. Villages were lost to both combat and grim. And it wasn't long before Vacuo decided to join the party. <laughs> Why exactly? They seem pretty point, removed from this. Vacuo had done its best to stay out of the fight. Mantle and Mistral, having both already established a small ah. presence in Vacuo territory years before, promised to leave them provided they didn't interfere. Soon, those talks evolved. It went from of don't course. side with them to side with us and you'll be safe. Vacuo did not much care for that. And they came to the conclusion that if Veo were to fall, there'd be no one left to stop Mistral and Mantle from conquering them next. So they did what they considered to be the logical thing. They drove Mantle and Mistral out of Vacuo and told Veo I love their style. <laughs> so the war raged on. Grim attacks increased worldwide. Yeah. The battlefield this met a temporary ceasefire. That just complicates things. Hordes of monsters before returning to the fight at hand. Those left miserable back at home, however, were often helpless with their best warriors away fighting the good fight. A lot of settlements were lost during these years, and most were never reclaimed. Rations on food and dust were put into effect. Development of technology accelerated. <sighs> Humans and faunas who fought alongside one another became closer. And every day, mankind grew more and more efficient at destroying itself. Well, that's pretty bleak. But it all ended in the Vacuo campaign. Oh. Mistral and Mantle knew that if they could take the dust mines of Vacuo... They would effectively cut off the supply of dust to their enemy. It was to be a final devastating blow to Vale and Vacuo. They were only half right. 
The King of Vale personally led his army into battle alongside the soldiers of Vacuum and decimated the enemy forces. Crown atop his head and armed only with a sword and his scepter, he hmm. laid waste to countless men. Well, definite badass there. <laughs> the sand was soaked red with blood. The grim came in droves. It was the single deadliest battle of the war, and legends of the greatness and terror of the warrior king were born that day. Historians will tell you most of these stories are nothing but grandiose hyperbole. Unusually violent weather conditions, combined with Mantle's unfamiliarity with the desert combat, are likely what led to such a high death count. But whatever the reasoning, everyone bowed to the King of Vale by the time it was over. The Great War had ended. Hmm. The world was ready to live under the rule of Vale. But the King refused. The leaders of the Four Kingdoms met on the island of Vital, and it was there yeah. that they worked together to form a treaty and establish the future of Remnant. Territories were redistributed, slavery was abolished, governments restructured, and the warrior king, the last king Vale would ever have, founded the Huntsman Academies and placed his most trusted followers in command of each kingdom. Okay. He would teach the world to fight so long as we promise to fight for ourselves and never against ourselves. Cool. Seems like we haven't kept our end of the bargain. Yeah. Yeah, there's that. <sighs> okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Who wants to bet that the king there at the end is in fact a previous incarnation of Ozpin? Uh, <laughs> that just seems like it's too obvious not to be the case. Because, I mean, he he's a complete badass and he has the scepter, which kind of looks like the thing that Ozpin uses. And, uh, yeah, he's uh, the guy who founded Beacon and he didn't want the power all for himself, so he's kind of this cool guy. And it, it just, it, it's Ozpin. I'm just going to assume that that's the case uh, <laughs> so that's cool uh these were all pretty good lots of great information first one not really a lot of new stuff kind of stuff that's already been covered throughout the episodes the stuff with the bandits and the grim and the villages stuff that we already knew but it was presented well crow is a great narrator and the visuals were strong it was entertaining like all of these were uh, second one here was the Faunus, and that, that offered a bit more new information. Uh, learned a bit more about the history of the Faunus and what they went through. And also a bit about genetics, which I wasn't expecting. Apparently a human and a Faunus will have a Faunus child, generally. Uh, which is... that makes sense. It'd be a dominant trait. What makes less sense is... Uh, <laughs> apparently two completely different sorts of Faunus will have a completely random child that will be some other variety of Faunus. Uh, <laughs> which doesn't make a lot of genetic sense. Usually, I mean, it would be one or the other. Uh, but I, I guess that clarifies that Gira is probably a cat Faunus as well, since Blake is a cat Faunus like the mother. Since it's, it's not obvious with him. He doesn't have an obvious feature like ears or a tail that we've seen. Uh, we don't really know what his animal feature is. I would guess maybe claws that will come out when he fights eventually, or something like that. I I don't know, but uh, we'll find out eventually, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, that was a good one. And then the third one, Schnee Dust Company. Uh, not too much new information there. Stuff I had kind of already known. Uh, well, that's because the big reveal here was Jacques had married into the family, and I already seen the episode where that was said, and that kind of wrecked that reaction a bit. I think. That's maybe the big consequence of waiting on these, is that that was something that was revealed here first, and I didn't hear it until that episode. So when it was revealed there, I paid more attention to that than the fact that Jacques slapped his daughter. And uh, maybe that sort of skewed that in a way that it wasn't for the best of the reaction. Uh, but nothing to do about it now. And, uh, yeah, well, nothing really else to say about that one. It was basically... What I had already assumed about that family and the business and everything like that. Uh, the final one was the most interesting, as I was already talking about it a bit with Ozpin and whatnot. 
the Great War, great to hear about that, hear what the sides of it were, in fact, that it was uh, Mistral and Mantle versus Vale and Vacuo. M versus V. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was just a really interesting piece of history for the, for the world, a piece of lore. Uh, I don't know really what effects it will have on the actual story for the series or anything like that, but it's great information to know, and I'm sure it'll become it'll it'll become relevant in time as we go on and see more of whatever happens in the story. Uh, I'm sure there will be other references to the Great War and whatnot. I, I do like how it did sort of make the whole repressing uh, creativity thing make sense. That uh, I wasn't really sure with Ospin's speech why they would do that, but to sort of repress emotions so that Grimm don't attack, I, I can kind of get that now. That kind of does make a bit of sense. I mean, it's an extreme, weird, and ridiculous thing to try and do, but at least I can see where they're coming from. So, that's cool. Uh, other than that, not much else to say, but these were cool. Glad to watch them finally. Hope you enjoyed the reaction. Let me know if you did, and see you in the next one.